Um, just before starting, just to remind you that there's a little feedback cards at the back, so when the talk is over, you can just pick how you feel it went and put it in the box. Um, so I'd like to introduce Hadi Hariri, and he's going to talk about Kotlin. Like these things, so. or is that better now? That's better now. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, fine. So, um, normally the sessions after lunch aren't very good because what happens is that you eat a lot, you start to fall asleep. Fortunately, here it's not the case because I saw the tiny little sandwiches. So I'm guessing you haven't ate a lot. So no one's sleepy. Uh, how many of you came to the session about comparing the languages? Right. So a lot of people came. Obviously. Some of them didn't like Kotlin, so they didn't come back. Um, but I'm guessing those that are here are because you're interested in Kotlin. How many of you are actually doing some Kotlin? OK, seen it in the past. OK, great. Cool. So I'm going to, this is a very, um, as I would say, a non-bullshit talk in that I'm basically going to give you what there is with Kotlin. And I'm not trying to sell it. I'm trying to, well, I am trying to sell it. Well, OK, technically sell it. It's, it's free and open source, but I'll try and sell it anyway. Um, so it's, it's, you know, if you're comfortable with other languages, it's absolutely fine by me. If there's anyone here that loves Scala, I would suggest you leave the room. Because we always say that, you know, if you're happy with Scala, you probably don't need Kotlin. If you're suffering with Scala, then maybe Kotlin is an option for you, OK? We have tried to avoid. Um, and I don't want to be quoted on this, but we, Kotlin doesn't have the kitchen sink. I'm not implying that other languages do, but Kotlin doesn't have the kitchen sink. And we're not trying to give you absolute freedom to do absolutely anything you want. Okay? So there are restrictions with the language. So I'll start. My name is Hadi. I work at JetBrains. Um, again, uh, you, you pro have you heard of JetBrains, IntelliJ? Okay, good. Um, I'll be using that today. Eclipse wouldn't start. Um, and. So, um, and I, I run the evangel uh, de technical developer advocate slash technical evangelism team, and I'm somewhat involved in the Kotlin team as well. Okay? So, uh, Kotlin, what is it? That's Lighthouse from, the, if, you, if you're not familiar, Kotlin comes actually from the name, originates from an island near St. Petersburg in Russia. Uh, so, we've got one of the largest offices in St. Petersburg, and Kotlin is the name of an island there. Uh, it's also the name of a class destroyer, um, big ship. And that's a lighthouse someone took from the, one of the guys from JetBrains took uh, from Kotlin itself. So um, it's a statically typed language. Uh, for, me, for me, I like it better. Having spent my life doing dynamic and static languages, I, I, I really wish JavaScript has a slow death. Um, I love, I have to program JavaScript, but I don't really enjoy it. I, I really think that static languages probably provide you with better benefits over dynamic languages. Um, but we can argue about that later. Uh, targets the JVM and JavaScript. So Kotlin was originated for us um, for a series of goals that we'll go through. Uh, and the primary goal, I mean, our primary need was a JVM. Um, why did we add JavaScript? Because if you don't, it's not considered a hipster language. Everyone you know, targets JavaScript, so we said, what the hell, we'll do it as well. Um, but it actually has provided some benefits for us. It's free and open source. Um, and that means free in all aspects, even when you want to use it. It's not a try and lock into uh, IntelliJ or any, by, by any means. And it's developed primarily by us, but of course it also has external contributors. In fact, one of the early contributors to the standard library was James Strachan, who's at the, at the conference and the guy behind Groovy. Uh, you'll probably see it and you'll compare it a little bit to Groovy. It's heavily influenced by Groovy. It's not heavily influenced by Swift because it came out before Swift. Um, but a lot of people say, oh, look, JetBrains came out with a, couple of, a copy of Swift. No. Um, why? So this is why we did this. We need this for ourselves. We, we created Kotlin for our own need. Uh, but you know, nowadays, and this joke doesn't work anymore because Apple and Swift is now um, open source. But nowadays, it would be really stupid to create a language and not release it as open source. Apple did a few years ago. Now they've made it open source. So we said that from the beginning, it's going to be open source. And it's going to be and it's under the Apache Foundation. Um, but we did it primarily for ourselves, and it is still for ourselves. But by all means, other people are using it, and you guys can too. One of the goals was for it to be concise, to be more concise than Java. 
um, which isn't a hard thing to say, right? I mean, Java is as verbose as it gets. Uh, we have, just so you get an idea, you know, JetBrains has multiple products, but around uh, everything that is JVM based, which is all of the IntelliJ tools, all of the server side tools, TeamCity, UTrack, all of these are using Java as a primary language. Then some plugins are using other languages, but Java is a primary language. And then we've got the .NET tools that are using mostly C Sharp. So we wanted something that we could continue to write our tools in that was more concise than Java. And we tried a whole bunch of languages, and we found issues with different languages. And then we got on board initially with the Ceylon folks. Um, but then our goals started to diverge. So that's why we ended up with, with Kotlin. So we did try different things beforehand. Um, we wanted a fast language, at least as fast as Java. Uh, Java. Uh, it's way faster than Scala right now, but it's still not as fast as Java, but we're still working on that. It has incremental compilation. We're adding that to Gradle support, et cetera. So it's, you know, that is one of the key, um, ben uh, key requirements by us as well. A safe language in that you know you, you probably run into null reference exceptions, and we want to try and avoid that and avoid any mistakes that the compiler could catch itself. A simpler language than Scala, which again you know it's not hard. How many of you have worked with Scala, All right? And managed to end up in a twist somewhat with the language? No? Okay. Um, so we tried it, and maybe you know we weren't too good at it, but it can lead to unmaintainable code bases much like any language, but that's more propensed to. And very importantly, it had to be interoperable because we've got a large code base in, for IntelliJ and all the other tools, and we couldn't stop shop and start to rewrite everything. So we wanted a language that we could continue to work and continue to integrate and mix and match Java and Kotlin, and that's exactly what we're doing now. So one of the main goals is 100% interoperability with Java. And that means that you can run Java code, you can call Java code from Kotlin, you can call Kotlin code from Java, you can mix Java and, Scala, and, Java and Kotlin in the same project. You can mix Java and Scala as well, Kotlin and Scala. Um, Java and Kotlin in the same project, you can use anything from Java, all of the JVM is available. Um, and people sometimes when they come to Kotlin, they ask us and they say, right, where's the ecosystem? Where are all the frameworks? Where are all of these? You don't need it. That's the whole point, right? Everything that you have on the JVM should be available you. Another thing is, can you make it a little bit more idiomatic? Yes. You can write little wrappers around what has already exist to give you a more concise way of interoperating with the libraries, etc. But you don't need to rewrite, invent everything from scratch. So what does it consist of? Uh, Kotlin basically is a language. It's got a small runtime, very small. It's got a, a standard library. It's now got an additional library, which is its own reflection, which you don't have to include, much like the standard library. And as I said, it compiles down to JVM and to JavaScript. What do we provide from a JetBrains perspective? We provide tooling, and we, all, we do it for free. We have the IntelliJ Community Edition, so you can get up and running with Kotlin, and Kotlin will always work with that. And of course, we're hoping that you get so hooked on that that you want to then buy the Ultimate Edition, and then you switch over to the commercial one. Um, that means we provide you with IntelliJ, we provide you with support for build tools, so that is the command line compiler, Gradle, and um, Maven, if you really have to. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it, anything that can run from script. We also, believe it or not, do a plugin for Eclipse, hoping that one day the community will pick that up, but for now we're providing the support for Eclipse. And then we also provide a series of extensions, some of which I'll show you. Anyone doing Android development here? Okay, well then I won't show you those. Fine, um, but maybe I will. We'll see. Uh, but we do offer a, bit, a bunch of uh, Android extensions, which are makes it much nicer for um, Android development. And that's why people say kind of this is the swift of Android, because it's much nicer than Kotlin, um, than, than Java. It runs on Android, so it's all fine. Um, also, it's compatible with JDK six, seven, and eight, right? So you can run this on Java six as well. Okay. And then libraries and frameworks, also OSS and free. So really, Kotlin for us has no, um, there's no business value around it in the sense of us providing anything commercially. It's more around our own needs and then, you know, people using our tools. What does the community provide? Well, they provide contributions to Kotlin and to existing libraries. 
and they also provide their own libraries and frameworks. There's been a urge, surge of uh, Kotlin-focused uh, libraries in the past year. A lot of Android applications are written in Kotlin as well as other types of apps. Okay, any questions before we just switch over to code? Yes. Compilation, yeah. yeah. So the question is we want it something faster, faster in compilation, yeah. The JVM, this Kotlin compiles down to bytecode, so there really isn't any overhead. In fact, in a lot of performance testing, if it's not the same as Java, it beats it in some ways. Um, we have a few things which I'll talk about, such as uh, inlining functions, uh, tail recursion, all of these things that can actually improve performance. Okay? Yes, using RoboVM. Yes, are you using it? Okay, so if you're using RoboVM, which is, um, uh, a, well, now they've come out with RoboVM Studio, which is a complete IDE built on IntelliJ Community Edition, which provides you with the ability to create Android applications and iOS apps running RoboVM. Um, Just to complete the picture of, yeah, yeah, you can use Kotlin. Everything. You can use it for everything. Okay. So, let's see some code. Um, now, before I switch over to IntelliJ, I'm going to show you my, um, my, my, uh, this is really painful. Uh, I'm going to show you my hipster skills, which means I'm going to switch over to the terminal. And let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, what is a hipster? Right, so fun, main, args, array of string, print line, hello. Okay, so that's basically your m minimum Kotlin file. So there's no class, you don't even have to declare a package, anything. It's just, it looks like JavaScript. You can notice that we have top-level functions, which means that you don't need to create static classes and static methods in order to just, you know, have a function, which normally end up in a class called helper, or if they're not in helper, end up in a class called utils, right? Now you can put them in a file called utils, right? You know, we, we don't solve all the issues. Um, so now I could just write Kotlin C, and what that would give me is basically a, a REPL kind of thing. It's an interactive command for Kotlin, so I could do 1 plus 1 equals 2, um, but I can also call Kotlin C with some parameters, so I would say hello, kt, include runtime, and then let's say hello.jar, and that creates for me uh, hello.jar, and now I could just do java, jar, hello.jar, oh, there you go, cool, very simple. I didn't do that so that I show you my awesome hipster skills, it was more around the simplicity of what we're trying to accomplish from tooling in all aspects. Um, so you don't need to use an ID. Now, if you're a real developer, you'll use an ID. Okay, so what we'll do here is I can say file new project, and then when you select Kotlin, now this is a little bit confusing because you can actually use Gradle or anything. Um, but how many of you use Gradle? Maven, IntelliJ build system, okay. So this is the default IntelliJ build system. And if I just click Kotlin JVM next, and let's put that in temp, Kotlin samples. Now here you can select the runtime. You say create, and you've got two options with IntelliJ. You can either say take the con existing runtime that's installed in the ID and copy it to a lib folder, or just use the library um, provided uh, via the plugin. What this means is that if I upgrade Kotlin, then it will just use the latest one that's installed in the IDE. Until we release, that's probably the recommended option, okay, unless you want to ship against a specific um, version. So, and then we'll call this uh, Hello World. And that should have updated, Hello World. And hit OK. So now I basically get my source folder and I get everything that you know, you normally expect. And I can just say Kotlin file, call it whatever, and then again type main, 
and you can see that it's got the main out and I say print line hello again and then right click or shift control R and then that will run the package for me okay so I also have that and then you can um, activate incremental compilation to make it a little bit faster so I can say Kotlin and uh, where is it uh, plugins oh it's already uh, activated okay so there you go um, as I said you don't need any package now you can see that at the top it says default package right now um, because it's using an underscore default package so if I say for example package um, Barcelona then I right click that it will tell me to um, change file package to oh never mind go away sometimes I hate IntelliJ um, and I can just hit run and then what that will do is run it under Barcelona package okay so basically this is kind of like the default main class right um, any questions nothing where's the print line coming from no interest screw it move on not interested okay that's there's default imports right so some things aren't imported um, okay so now let's switch over and show some of the actual code of what this can do right so this is your typical Java bean um, or class or whatever you want to call it um, so this is basically a whole bunch of code uh, that allows me to you know have a have a customer class with five four private fields and then a constructor set those properties getters and setters equals hash code etc right so what is the purpose of this again why are we trying to do this Kotlin thing it's to be more concise so you could actually do that in Kotlin well like that let's forget that for now so that's the same thing okay so all of that code is basically just reduced to a simple class right and notice that with Kotlin you don't need to even have um, bodies you, you don't the, the body is optional now this isn't actually entirely correct because this also has a bunch of other methods namely equals and hash code right so this isn't entirely uh, comparable but if I add this thing over here which is an annotation in Kotlin and annotations in Kotlin don't need to actually have a uh, ampersand in, only in certain cases um, what this is now going to do is provide me with an equals a hash code and a two string right so I could now go ahead and do for example let's say main and then say val customer one equals customer mutable customer mutable now this is also called the primary constructor so in Kotlin this ha already has four parameters being passed in as a constructor you can also have secondary constructors in Kotlin but right now I'm saying that if you want to create a customer it needs to be defined basically with parameters in, in, the, in the constructor so I can say var a b c and then val customer 2 well, actually let's get rid of that name that to 2 and if we do something like if customer one equals customer two then print line the same now that should give me no output right because they're not the same um, the, it, it's doing a referential comparison and basically it's saying it's not the same uh, if we add a data the structural comparison now is basically going to say yep these should be the same because they've got exactly the same fields okay so really easily I can now just basically take all of that boilerplate code and just cut it down to a single to a single line which is my data bean, my bean object okay now this is mutable that's why it's called mutable because of var uh, if you want a mutable then all you do is just pass in val and I think the, um, in the previous session they were saying that Kotlin doesn't do immutability by default no right you have to say whether you want val or var but a lot of the things like the list and that are we tend to go for immutability okay any questions no great let's carry on seriously any questions
Uh, in this case, uh, you are generating this boilerplate because of the data uh, annotation. Can you select which, which uh, fields? So by default, um, if you, if a pro so if I look, if I don't, if I remove this, that no longer is a property, right? That is just um, a value that I'm passing in a constructor. Uh, so as, as soon as I add that, it becomes a property. So anything that's a property will be included. If you don't want that, then you have to override the two hash string, et cetera, and do your own, which in that case, sometimes you've got to see w whether it's worth it. Or should I just write my own anyway, right? Right. Um, so next, this is very, uh, again, casting. So this is cheating because the, the IntelliJ is giving you hints. Um, but notice here that, first of all, Kotlin by default is closed, right? So essentially what that means is that every, every class is final. This means that if you want to inherit from a class, you have to explicitly declare it as open. So here I have a, a base class vehicle, and then I have a car vehicle and a plane vehicle, and then I have a method on, ve on plane, which is takeoff, right? Here, notice that I'm just saying if vehicle is plane, then vehicle take off. What is missing here? The explicit casting. Again, the compiler is trying to be, you know, is smart enough to define, the, to, to realize that you are actually inside a conditional and you've checked that this is a vehicle of type plane. Therefore, don't make me explicitly write that code again, right? And that's why this goes green, which I don't know if you can see. Yes, you can see. You see, smart cast to save plane, okay? Again, what is the purpose of this? To having to stop writing the same boilerplate code over and over again, right? Um, some people say, you know, Kotlin essentially is taking away a lot of the work that IntelliJ does for you when you have to write Java code. Like, you don't need to generate all of those things. We, we feel that it, it, it's worthwhile. Um, null safe. In Kotlin, things by default are null, uh, are not nullable. So that means that, for instance, here I have a var of time named string. If I uncomment this, you can see that it says you cannot assign null to this type. Okay, so if I want it to be nullable, I have to use the question mark, which now means that this can be nullable. Now this works great, and then you can have things like, uh, you know, a nullable string. But what happens with interoperability? So for example, here I have files test. So this is Java file, right? List files. If this returns null and I call list files on this, it would blow up, right? So I could do things like use the Elvis operator, which basically says only call this if it is not null. Now I can give you a word of warning here. We've tried a bunch of things here. When we initially did this, this would be a compiler error. It would say you have to either explicitly call the Elvis operator or the double hash bang, which is basically saying I'm an idiot and I want to cause a null reference exception. Um, that's what this means. Well, not the idiot part, but yes, you could potentially call a null reference exception. What happened, though, is that when we were looking at code bases that people were writing with Kotlin, you would see question marks all over the place and double hash banks, and it didn't look great. And then we tried a different approach in terms of null, null annotations, which basically what uh, IntelliJ would do, or via Gradle, it would annotate your entire code base and say, okay, here it's safe to call null, etc. Right now, we're basically on the sticking to the option of making it a warning, and then you can add it when, when, when required, okay? And then we can do things like, you know, just a print line, if file size, well, this has changed. This is um, going to replace with file size. So this is saying, if it's not null, then um, show the size. If not, show file as empty. So removing all of the if and just making it much shorter, okay? Okay, so, Again, aiming for conciseness, aiming for correctness, those are part of the goals, right? Now, some things that we have. Uh, so here's that data class that you saw before. And in that data class, I have a function. And what I'm doing here is I'm overriding an operator. So you've got a bunch of operators that you can override. So you have plus, plus inc, um, equals, compare to, etc. There's a list on the website. So now what I do is I override the plus operator. Right? And I say that, you know, now given two datas, when I do data plus data, then it should do this operation. Okay? 
So we're just using conventions for overriding operators. You can't really create your own operators. You can, and it, as in symbols, kind of like Scala, but you can override the default ones that we provide. Okay. Here is loops. This is really simple. Like again, going back to the conciseness. What does that do? That just defines a list of numbers, one to a hundred, right? There's no need if you if you if you've worked with Haskell. Haskell kind of has the same approach. There's no need to do all of the, you know, kind of like the list of 1 to 100. Why? Just I want 1 to 100. That's it. That's what I'm going to get. And then what I can do is also here, you see that there's no for. Um, there's no explicit val required or var required. I just say for element in elements, then print line the element. So very much kind of like JavaScript here. By the way, did you notice something in the customer mutable, there's no new keyword either in Kotlin. Okay? Again, what we can try and figure out, we will. So here is another version of pairs. So here I'm doing a list of pairs. And I say list of and then pair. Initially we used to have Kotlin, in Kotlin we used to have tuples or tuples. So you could create tuples of any any arity. Um, then we got rid of them in favor of data classes because the, the issue with tuples is that once you hit over a certain number, it starts to become a little bit cumbersome in clarity. You don't know what the first component is, you don't know what the second component is, you don't know what the third component is. So to try and avoid that kind of people, well, that kind of code being written, um, we drop tuples. Okay, so now we just have pairs and I think we have triples, but that's about it. I hardly ever use triples. Okay? So here is an example of just creating a list of pairs. I say pair London to UK, Madrid to Spain, right? Now here's a different version of creating pairs. Um, you can see that, let me move this up. So you can see that I'm using this, two. What is two? Kotlin allows you to create top level functions, right? Two is just a function. However, Kotlin also allows you to call functions in infix, right? So what I'm doing is just saying to London, open brackets, London, UK. This is controversial because it has impacted some libraries out there. So we're kind of still debating whether we leave two or in there or not. But it does look nice, especially when you're doing demos, right? London to UK, Madrid to Spain. Now here's another one, again, around, around readability. Those two lists of pairs, notice here that I can now do multi um, declarations. So I can say city, country in list of pairs and then print out the values. And I also have string interpolation here. Okay? Any questions? Really? Nothing? Is it that clear? Is it that boring? No? Are you understanding? Oh, you got to come. Okay. Here, hold on. Find it the list of fields on yeah. the top of the class definition. You are also defining the, the accessors, the cater and setter. Yes, that basically does it. So every it's time you create a var, that will define an access a getter and a setter. If you create a val, it will only define a getter. There's no real fr private fields in Kotlin as such. Um, there's an underlying auto field which you could access, uh, but there's no real um, private field. Okay. Good enough. Okay. What else? Uh, right. Let's look at objects. Now, if you've done JavaScript, you know that in JavaScript there is no such thing as class. Everything is an object, right? In Kotlin, we have classes and we have objects. So, if you want to create a singleton, you just create an object. Okay. So this is a singleton essentially. Now, I'm not saying you should go and create singletons. Singletons can be bad, but for certain things, they're okay. But basically saying that um, this is just an object. I no longer need to create an in, uh, instance method of it or anything. And then inside classes, we can have objects as well, which would kind of be the equivalent translated to um, Java of static, right? So we have what we call companion objects, right? And then inside here, we can then define whatever we want, okay? But we can also have top-level objects. Objects also allow us to implement classes anonymously. 
So I don't have to, you know, if I want to implement the typical handler or what have you, where in Java you have to do it because there's no lambdas unless in Java 8, here you can just do it um, directly. Okay? Now, no, it's not equivalent to a class object. Um, extensions. Now this is, how many of you have ever done C Sharp? Right. In C Sharp we have this thing called extension methods, which basically means that you can take a class and add functions to it, methods to it, right? And for that you have to create a static class and then a static method and then pass this in as the first parameter of the method. In Kotlin this is how you extend the class, right? So right now I've extended a class string and it could be a Java class that I'm extending or it can be a C Sharp, uh, or not C Sharp, I'll be the day. Um, it could be a Java or a Kotlin class. So now I'm extending Kotlin with and, the string class with and. And I reference the instance of the object of that class I'm extending with this. Okay? And I, since I can also call it an infix, I can do this or I can do this. Right? And this, with a few other things which we'll see, give way to allowing us to create certain nice DSLs in a very easy, in, in a very easy way. Okay, so here, for example, I've created um, a list. I've extended the list of T as JSON, and basically, what I would do is use something like Jackson or whatever to take the object and serialize it to JSON. What that means is that anywhere in anywhere of my code, if I want JSON, I just say val JSON equals customer. Uh, well, not customer, but um, list of uh, customer and as JSON, right? And then that would give me the customer's JSON, right? No need to actually have an, ex an extent, an, a, a, a util class or anything to do that. Yes? One question about type erasure. You are using a list um, T, well, but T is not available at runtime. It's not known in Java, isn't it? Well, okay, yes and no. Um, if you use, uh, so the question is about, yeah, reified, uh, you know, there's type erasure in, uh, in Java. Um, in Kotlin, you can actually have reified generics. Uh, so that means that you get access to the type. However, that only works if the function is in line and you explicitly mark it as reified. If you mark that, then you will be able to have access to the types. So maybe this would be possible. OK, I, I'll probably have to pass the Java class type there. OK, just an example. OK? Um, now, here we also have you know lambdas typical lambda so here is a, a is is a lambda expression um, and you can see that this is yellow it's because you can um, migrate to the new lambda syntax this is one thing that we do offer when you use IntelliJ so the language isn't released yet but as we make changes we offer you quick fixes so you can basically hit alt enter and then just replace the code okay um, and we normally the way that we do it is Let's say that we're on M12, then what we do with M13, we will release, um, we will release a warning saying that this is going to be obsolete. And then in the next version, we'll provide you with a, well, in that version, you'll probably get the quick fix. And in the next version, you'll also get the quick fix to migrate stuff. Here is an ex another example of extending the big decimal class in, in, in Java. So I have a minus, which is operator overloading. And then I say subtract the value, and then I could do things like 2.0 dot big decimal minus 1.0 dot big decimal. Okay, so extension functions, if used wisely, can be really nice. Another thing that we have is delegation, right? So here you can see that we have uh, a typical customer repository, and then we have a get all, for instance, and then I have your everyday controller that takes a customer repository trait. By the way, we've now rename traits to interface. Why? Because when we came out with traits, it wasn't the same as Java 8 interfaces. It couldn't have default method implementations. Now it can. So to kind of keep in line, we renamed it back to interfaces. So here, you've seen this pattern. This is called dependency injection. And basically what I'm doing is delegating the functionality of get all of the, to a customer repository. We have first class delegation. So here what you can say is custom repository trait by customer repository, and then I could just invoke get all. And that is delegated to customer repository trait. Okay? So it's kind of like the concept of mix in, in a sense. Now the question is, what happens if I have four dependencies being passed in? How do I know which one corresponds to what without having to, you know, 
hit control B and go into it to figure out where it is, right? How would I know that? The answer is you shouldn't have four dependencies being passed in, okay? If you do, you've probably got a bad design somewhere there, right? You're breaking single responsibility. In addition to supporting, um, you know, passing in properties and delegating them, we're well, passing in um, dependencies and delegating them, we also have property delegation. Right? So not only method delegation, but property. So for example, this is a lazy property, and we have a bunch of delegates built, built in. So to create a delegated property, you basically have to create a class that matches this interface. Okay? So this is a get and a set. right? But we also have a bunch built in. So for example, this is lazy, which means that it's a lazy um, it, it's evaluated lazily, so on the first call. This is not null, because remember that in Kotlin, you can't have nulls, but sometimes you want to actually have a property that you cannot initialize through the constructor, so you could use delegates not null. Um, we have observable properties built in, so just every time something changes, it will fire off the event that has been observed. Okay? Right. Now functionals and functions. So this is Java. I need to override. I need to add an extra parameter. I have to create an overload. In Kotlin, we have pro uh, optional parameters and we have name parameters. So here I have optional parameters x, y, z equals 1. This means that I can call optional parameters with 30, and that will default to 1. You can also notice that Kotlin has very good type inference. I don't even have to specify the return type. In fact, if the result of the function is an expression, I could just put it on the same line. I don't even need to put this inside and open braces, close braces, and then a return. Okay? So, you know, very easy um, in terms of optional parameters and name parameters. Now, when you're doing functional things, yep, we also have that. Now, this is basically the same. I have numbers, and then on numbers, I can call map, right? Now, map takes a delegate, sorry, takes a predicate, which is a higher order function, okay? Now, in Kotlin, we have a convention whereby if the first or the last parameter, if the only parameter or the last parameter of a function is another function, you don't have to put the braces. Sorry, the, cur the brackets. So that's why you see this in this structure, right? So this is actually the same as me doing this and passing in a lambda expression. It's basically doing the same thing, okay? I'm now passing in a lambda expression. I'm just chaining the calls, right? This is the same as this. Okay? So I'm chaining those calls, passing in a lambda expression. It, what is it? If you're familiar with Groovy, if a function only has a single parameter, you can call it it. Or you could be explicit and call it the name of the parameter. Right? I call it it. I also drop the brackets, and now it looks like code blocks. And this gives way to very cool things. What does it give way to? Let me show you. For example, if you're doing um, Android or HTML, you can create your layouts using code. And here you can see that we've created, this is one of the libraries that we've created, which is basically the ability to create extensions for uh, layouts for Android using code. But you can see that this gives way to a nice fluid DSL style, right? Because of several conventions that we have in Kotlin. Ability to have top level functions, ability to drop the brackets, etc., allows me to create very nice DSL-ish approaches, okay? If you're more interested in that, hook me up later or look for Kotlin uh, Groovy HTML Builders in Kotlin, which basically allows you to do HTML builders using statically typed language, okay? Um, so, you know, this is just simple. If you're interacting with Rx, uh, again, very simple. I can just, I don't even need to use the Rx adapters that are available for Kotlin. This is plain Rx Java. I just say observable from, this is a Java class, right? And it's a constructor. So it's got a from that takes an iterable. And then I say observable, subscribe, and again, like a code block. This is the lambda, but it's basically a code block, OK? This finishes at 20 paths, right? Five minutes left? Yeah, 10 minutes left, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to ask any questions, so we've got 10 minutes left. You have, you have any questions? No? Okay. Are you liking what you're seeing now? Okay, good. Right. Okay, so 
basically, you know, the, the point being here that I, you know, like, for example, the interoperability that I showed you earlier. So this is the customer mutable, um, and this is the customer class in Java. So I can come here in a Kotlin file, and I can say val um, Java customer equals customer, right? And then just say A, B, C, D, and it'll give me an error because that should be a 1, right? So you see, I can call Java without going through hoops or anything like that. And I can have Java and Kotlin in the same file, okay? And I get all of the goodness, like, you know, if I go to the Java file and if I create a, a, a you know, a customer mutable, customer mutable equals new customer mutable, um, one, A, B, C, and then I do customer mutable. What did I do wrong? Did I forget something? Oh, yes. In Kotlin, semicolons are optional. Difference to JavaScript, we don't have debates, endless debates about it on Hacker News. Um, so you can see that I have all of the get IDs, get emails, etc., set IDs that you're accustomed to when you're writing Java code, right? And even though that is basically a Kotlin class that is coming back to you. We really want to make it smooth, um, okay? So let me show you something else. Uh, also, you can actually create, um, uh, where is it? Kotlin uh, JavaScript. So you can also target JavaScript. In JavaScript, we have support for the dynamic keyword. Not for JVM yet, but in JavaScript, we do. So here's an example of me targeting JV, um, JavaScript. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying that this um, dynamic keyword is delegated. This is a no implementation kind of delegation, sort of. Um, and I'm saying that, you know, don't worry about the implementation. It's native. So JQ corresponds to the native called J J jQuery, which would be in JavaScript. And then here, I just can call JQ, and it will just treat it as a dynamic um, uh, property. So I could basically do whatever the hell I want on it. And then if you run this, you can see that basically what it's doing is just going and fetching a bunch of commits. Okay? What does this actually generate? If we switch back over, you can see that it generates some sta standard Kotlin libraries that we ship. Um, and then the output of this function, the, the dynamic, which is compiled to this. Um, we try and keep it clean. Uh, we're going to support it, kind of supports right now modules, um, NPM modules, um, but there are some tweaks you need to do before or after, but we're going to try and iron those out as well. Okay. Uh, okay. And that's it. Um, the, the, the Android stuff, as I said, you, you don't need. One thing that you do have is when, if you are using IntelliJ, so if I create a Java beaner, bean class, um, and then say, for example, uh, private int id. And then what I can do, you can take any, Kotlin, any Java class, if you're starting out with this, and say code, convert Java file to Kotlin file. Okay? And then it will just create it and screw up. Um, hey, we'll call it, you know, we'll call it, it's an eval. Not an eval. Did I just screw up the wrong thing as well? Anyway, never mind. It does work, I promise you. Let's just pretend it did. Okay. Let's go back to the slides just to finish up. So to try out Kotlin, you can go to online try.kotlinlang.org and you'll get something like that. Um, and you can log in. You can save your sessions there. Uh, you can basically play with it. It can output to the JVM or JavaScript so you don't have to actually install anything. Um, you can also download the command line compiler. Well, that's all on kotl.in or kotlinlang.org. Uh, it's all available there. The command line compiler is there. Uh, you can also download or play with IntelliJ Community or IntelliJ uh, Ultimate. If you're using Android Studio, you can also install the plugin for Android Studio and you can play with it there. And of course, RoboVM. Um, if you're using Eclipse, anyone using Eclipse? Okay. 
you can also get a plugin for Eclipse. Obviously, Eclipse won't have all of the features on par with IntelliJ, and obviously, you know, complete disclaimer, we're going to focus on IntelliJ. Okay? Adopting Kotlin, who's using it? There's a lot of people. There are actually a lot of people, and people ping us. Um, the thing is that we don't know firsthand. You know, people don't ping us all the time and say, oh, we're using Kotlin. But we hear a, lo a lot of people. Like, for example, Prezi, which I'm sure you've heard of, that, um, that presentation software which makes you really, really drowsy, um, you know, that zooms in and out. There, as far as I know, they started on Kotlin a few years ago, and any new code they were writing, they were basically writing it in Kotlin. Um, a hell of a lot of Android applications using Kotlin. We're using Kotlin. We have it in production. We have an internal tool that we're using. We have parts of our tools writ being written in Kotlin. If you've used WebStorm and the live update, which automatically updates the, brow the, the browser as you change things in JavaScript or CSS, that's written in Kotlin targeting JavaScript. JetBrains accounts, if you go to our site where you log in, all of that is written in Kotlin. The new sales application is written in Kotlin. So we've got it in production, and we've got a lot invested in it. Uh, so, you know, this, is, this isn't a uh, let's try this and if it works and if we make money off of it, let's continue. If it doesn't, let's abandon it because that's not the goal. That was never the goal. In fact, if anyone figures out how we can make money on Kotlin, call me. Um, learning curve. People, you know, I'm sure you've heard of a, a talk by Rich Hickey that's called Simple Made Easy. If you haven't, I recommend you watch it. There's a difference between, he makes the distinction between simple and easy. Easy is something that you're accustomed to. Easy is something that you're already familiar with. So it's easy to pick up. Simple isn't necessarily in reference to closure. Closure isn't simple. This is easy. We intentionally made this easy. We intentionally made it look like Java, Groovy, and other languages because we don't want a massive ramp up time. We have certain goals. Right? And we did this in a way so that you, as a Java developer or C-sharp developer, can pick up Kotlin easily in a day. Read Kotlin. I'm sure that you've probably understood everything I've written there, except maybe the brackets of the Lambda expression. Right? Then you can start to write idiomatic Kotlin, but even then it's still pretty readable. Risks, as I said, we're in this. So you know, JetBrains right now is 600 people, and we're doing quite well. So we would have to completely collapse um, for us to stop. But even then, it's open source. Um, release. The question is, when will it release? I don't know. Uh, you know, if, if you're waiting for it, and it's funny, I find different camps and different communities are different in this sense. You know, the JavaScript people or community will put into production software that someone threw up on NPM and is at 0 0.00007, whereas the Java community is like, I'm not even looking at it until it hits 1.0. Go figure. Um, but that same Java community also used those NPM packages. Um, so we, we want to make sure that we are not screwing things up. Because once we hit 1.0, we, ne we need to maintain backwards compatibility. And we are in M12, which is a release. Uh, and we've already changed language things, but I can tell you that more or less we're now ironing out all of the hot issues, and it should be OK. But again, as I said, as we release new interim builds, we provide quick fixes and options for upgrade files. So it really isn't an issue. OK, thank you. And those are my contact details. If you have any questions, I'll be around a little bit afterwards. And we're done. Thanks. So any last questions?